on whole school writing approaches. Um, hopefully, if you are watching this session afterwards, then you are able to uh, pick out some of the key ideas. Um, and although you may not be able to um, engage in some of the discussion um, through some of our online activities, you could still potentially do that back in your departments and um, back at your schools as well. So my name's Amy. I am the assistant head at Chilton Academy with um, lead responsibility for literacy across the curriculum, among other things. And I've also invited uh, Hannah Granlau as a guest speaker for part of the session today. Uh, she is our disciplinary li literacy lead um, across the school as well. So the aims of this session, firstly, is to explore the importance of writing across the curriculum um, and how that fits within various different subjects. And then to consider the best practices um, that are out there based on research, particularly the EEF and then other um, educational pedagogy and then thirdly to consider the strategy to enhance writing across the curriculum um, and to improve that moving forwards within your own schools. So firstly within the chat box um, if you'd like to spend a moment or two or in your departments having a discussion what does extended writing currently look like in your subject or curriculum area? Okay, thank you for sharing those ideas with us. Hopefully um, you'll be able to see some of those um, key points um, with your colleagues and have a, have a um, enriching conversation within your departments. So extended writing, quite often people think, oh, well, the majority of that happens in English or potentially humanities. There's lots of essays and subjects like history. However, extended writing needs to be embedded everywhere within your curriculum, regardless of what um, department you are in or what subject you're teaching. So um, effective writing, um, in terms of extended writing, it needs to achieve the writer's goals. So you need to think about why is the student actually being asked to write this piece of um, text and who is it for? What's the context of this text? Who's your audience for it? Um, and that's that's going to vary within different departments, whether you're in science and you're writing a report, whether you're writing a, a history essay or whether you're writing a methodology and evaluation. There's lots of different writing styles and it is important um, that we teach students to be able to present these ideas in ways that clearly communicate what their intended meaning is and also gauges some kind of response or reaction from the reader, whether that's to be persuaded to do something, to learn about something, uh, to understand something in greater detail. But it's important that the students have that clear understanding before they begin their whole school um, writing. So I've got some examples here for you just to give you some ideas of what extended writing can look like in different departments. So the example here on the left is a PE experiment report and the example on the right is a drama research notes. So essentially, although this is typed in one subject, it's still considered extended writing because there is still um, a clear structure. And you can see in both of these that there are clear headings, we've got tables, we've got paragraphs, and students need to be taught how to use these in all subjects, not just in English, um, because that really helps with the structure of their work. Again, when we're looking at essays, so this is an example um, of an English essay, you can see there that the extent of the writing is probably uh, deeper in terms of what's required. Um, but some of the skills that are there in terms of using paragraphs and sentences um, are very, very, um, across curricula, in, in essence, we need them everywhere across the curriculum, as well as things like sequencing arguments. So particularly if your department focuses on things to do with debating or um, uh, humanities, I know do that quite well in our school, um, but I'm sure there are opportunities for debating elsewhere. Things like cohesive links and connectives. That is definitely something that we need to be teaching across the curriculum. And you can see that in uh, the English essays here, but you will also see that in some of the other essays um, and documents that I'll show you. And again, teaching students to be able to write clear conclusions or introductions to their writing. The next part here you can see um, is French. And again, those patterns are still coming up. The different sentences, the use of paragraphs, sequencing of points in this geography one on the right, um, and it allows the students to practice those uh, skills across the curriculum. In the French one as well, particularly in that second paragraph, you can see uses of um, questions. We've got um, exclamatory sentences in there. We've got um, quotation marks in there. And these are all punctuation skills that we would expect, yes, in English, but again, we do need to be teaching and embedding across the curriculum as well. And then the final example I've got here is an example of food technology. And although this is a very practical subject, um, you can see there this student's evaluation um, of their piece of work across the, um, across the lesson. And this has been developed over time. And you can see here the features of the what, why and how, which again is a writing structure that we would 
um, encourage in an English lesson, but again, is very transferable across the school. Um, sections and headings, bullet points and sentences, again, you can see how these things transfer everywhere. So therefore, um, it is not just English um, teachers' responsibility to push literacy across the curriculum, but it is um, the responsibility of every single teacher. Um, so hopefully, if you get a little bit of time, you can go away and have a look at those um, resources in more detail, particularly if they belong to a similar area of interest to you. Um, and see how that can fit into your curriculum. Now, one element that we do have at Chiltern Academy is a policy at the front of all exercise books. And I'm sure this is something that other schools um, have got as well, or, or they might have something similar. But essentially, this is what we use for our um, marking and feedback. So whether this is peer assessment, self-assessment or teacher assessment, we are constantly looking at how to live mark for literacy across the curriculum in every subject. So it's a simple case of, um, picking up your red pen or whatever pen colour you choose to mark with, um, walking around the room and as you're live marking, just underlining certain spelling mistakes, circling capital letters and putting a quick C in the margin, identifying any grammatical errors and so on. But having something like that in your exercise books at the start um, is perfect um, to kind of promote that as a whole school um, focus. So as mentioned earlier, we are all teachers of literacy. So a successful learner, um, needs to have successful literacy in your subject in order to be successful in your subject um, because literacy is the fundamental uh, for success in school and in later life. Students who cannot read and write and communicate effectively are highly unlikely to access the challenging academic curriculum in secondary school and are more likely to have poor educational outcomes across all subjects. So that, that clear um, focus on literacy underpinning success in all areas in the curriculum is specifically very, very strong here. So one book I'd like to draw your attention to, if you haven't seen it before, is a book called Teach Like a Writer, which is really popular among um, English teachers, but it's definitely a book that needs to be explored across the curriculum. And it's written by Jennifer Webb. Um, and in this book, she poses real life examples for writing. And one of the key arguments she makes is that exams are nothing like real world writing jobs. And she argues that we need to teach writing as an art and this requires practice. Now, I think that's important. So for the example of um, exams are nothing like real world writing jobs, for example, in an English exam, you might be asked to write a newspaper report in 40 minutes. In the real world, that, would, that wouldn't happen. They would have opportunities to research, to explore, um, to draft and, and redraft and the pressure's on in an exam condition. And we need to think about how we can combat um, those different those different sort of problems that they might face within an exam. And Jennifer Webb's kind of point within this book is about how to teach writing um, as if you actually write like that particular style of writer, whether that's to write like a journalist, to write like a historian, to write like a scientist, um, to write like a geographer, a dramatist, whatever subject it is, there is a style of writing that suits your subject. And it's about being able to teach that artistic flow um, in, in that area. So this document here on the right, um, which is a page from her book, asks um, to decide for yourself what language style you are required within your department. So when I look at that top one, that heavily decorated and flowery language is very much suited to English whereas the um, plain and direct language at the bottom might be more specific to a science di uh, a science experiment where you need to be very, very factual. Um, so it's about thinking about where you fit on that scale. And there's a, a chapter in each book almost for each department. So it's definitely worth having a look. It's also important when we look at our exam marks at Key Stage 4 um, for literacy. Um, yes, English has got the heavier weight in, but there's still 5% in history, geography, RE, and I'm sure other subjects as well, um, where that literacy weighting is strong. So we do need to teach students those skills. So firstly, I want you to draw your attention to what the national curriculum actually expects students to be able to do um, at secondary school. And it states that by the end of year six, um, so as they're coming up to you in year seven, the reading and writing should be su uh, sufficiently fluent and effortless so that students can manage the general demands of the year seven curriculum and then obviously beyond that as well and it states in all subjects not just in English um, and that they continue to learn the subject specific vocabulary which we will talk to you about a little bit more later in the presentation. Um, it mentions as well that teachers should prepare pupils for secondary education um, and also teaching conscious sentence control and structure in their writing and then also looking at how that students can consolidate practice and discuss this language um, 
within both their written and oral work as well. So the national curriculum is very specific in terms of what we need to do as teachers. And again, stresses that importance that this needs to come everywhere within the curriculum and not just within English. This is mirrored as well in the Ofsted handbook, which states that teachers ensure that their own speaking, listening, writing and reading of English support pupils in developing their language and vocabulary. And then again, Ofsted have also stated that uh, using writing as a means of reflecting and exploring a range of views and perspective on the world. So developing your own viewpoint, developing your opinions, being able to craft, create, argue, be artistic um, in other ways as well. I'll just give you a second to have a quick uh, read over this. This is a page from the book from Jennifer Webb, which I mentioned earlier. OK, and I think the main thing that what this is saying, what this is saying um, in her paragraph here is that without these fundamental skills, we are going to create students that will struggle later in life, that will not be able to express themselves, will not be able to communicate and justify decisions um, and that therefore we're putting them at a disadvantage. So it is so important that we create um, students that are confident um, with their writing and being able to express their own viewpoints as well. So just to raise the concerns with you, so these facts have come from um, the Reading Agency and I think they really highlight the issues with um, literacy when students aren't able to access properly. So the first one is that boys in England perform less well in reading than girls by an average of nine months of schooling. That one in five children cannot read well enough by the age of 11. Um, that's particularly important when trying to access texts um, in year seven. One in eight disadvantaged children in the UK don't own a single book. Um, that was something that we focused on at Chilton to make sure that every year seven student when they came in had a book of their own. There's a great company called Book Buzz, which um, allows you to do this as a gift for students. So something for you to have a look at if you're interested. 17% um, of 15 year olds in England do not have a minimum level of proficiency in literacy. Five-year-olds who are eligible for free school meals score 19 percentage points lower in literacy than their peers. And then that attainment gap, gap continues to grow through to GCSE. Um, by the final year of compulsory schooling, the reading skills of English children from disadvantaged backgrounds are on average two and a half years behind those from the most affluent homes. Um, and I think that fact for me is a really poignant one. And I'm going to talk to you um, later on in the session about some research from Alex Quigley um, and how to kind of close that gap um, because it, it is so significant um, at such a young age. Um, one in seven, so 5.1 million people, um, adult, one in seven adults, sorry, um, in England lack the basic uh, literacy skills and then nearly two in ten disadvantaged pupils did not achieve the expected standard in reading at key stage two compared with nearly one in ten non-disadvantaged pupils. So um, and then the final one here, 37% of 10 year olds reported reading for pleasure every day. And I think uh, that's quite sad in, in some ways, particularly when we're seeing that some students don't have a book to read. Um, it's no wonder that they're not enjoying reading for pleasure. So the aim of this session is going to kind of talk to you about how to close some of these vocabulary gaps in writing um, and also using reading and oracy to support those um, gaps as well. So the, the session is underpinned by the latest research from the EEF on improving literacy in secondary schools. And it recommends uh, seven sections here. Now I'm not gonna focus in on all of them today because the focus of this session is writing. Um, so I've mainly um, focused on those that are relevant to that, that area. However, if you did want to read further around the reading um, uh, recommendations, you will be able to find them on the EEF website online. So the first element um, from the EEF is, and it's prioritised as number one, is prioritising disciplinary literacy across the curriculum. Now, this is this is something that is strongly coming out within lots of educational literature at the moment. Um, and the importance of di disciplinary literacy across the curriculum is strong. Now, one um, element that we've done as a school to kind of promote this is, is employing Hannah um, in the role of disciplinary literacy lead. And a part of her role is to develop this within certain departments. She's working quite closely with subject leads to develop um, vocabulary and to develop access to um, exam questions and writing styles at various different levels. Um, and that's really starting to kind of promote that and push that across the school. So disciplinary literacy, there's the book here, Disciplinary Literacy and Explicit Vocabulary Teaching is another great book that um, 
I recommend you to read if you have some time. Um, but it's it's all about students being trained to access academic language and conventions of different subjects. Um, so not just understanding the, the general standard English, but the subject specific academic words that they need to be able to fully master um, the language of each subject. And that needs to be anchored within every subject as well. That vocabulary does need to be at the forefront um, of the curriculum within each area. So when you have some time back in your schools, um, I've got some questions here on how school leaders can prioritise disciplinary literacy. The first being um, audit what already happens. What practices do you already have in place? Who is responsible? Do you have somebody like Hannah who has that role within your school? Um, or does it does that come from your middle leaders? Um, and how are these roles allocated? Um, create these subject specific literary plans um, in each area and think about what the barriers to literacy would be. And then make sure that from a leadership perspective that teachers are supported to define the effective reading, writing and communication strategies within their subject areas. So I'm just going to pass you over to Hannah, who's going to give you a bit of background on disciplinary literacy. Hi, everyone. So disciplinary literacy is defined as advanced literacy instructions embedded within content area classes. So in other words, it's about teaching the literacy requirements that are specific to individual subjects as separate skills. Um, so in congruence with making cross curricular links, I think it's important to teach our students what's unique about each subject as well. In English, we tend to explicitly teach tier two vocabulary. Um, for example, when we're going through different texts that we're studying and that kind of thing. So these are high frequency words that are found across subjects, but we won't have the subject expertise to teach tier three vocabulary um, within its, its specific context. And these all consist of field specific jargon. So um, disciplinary, disciplinary literacy is really important and also helping to develop the thinking, the skills and um, the different tools that experts would tend to use in the disciplines. Um, and one of the ways that disciplinary literacy can really enrich your subject content as well is that you can link to metacognition practices by highlighting how reading a range of subject specific texts which would have those specific tier three vocabulary words can expand on students' understanding of class material and help to prepare students for GCSE reading levels. And of course, um, in other kind of like educational, um, in other education beyond GCSE. So um, I'm just gonna put the Padlet link in the chat now. Okay, so I think there's we've got a few more people joined the session. So if you do click on the link that Hannah's put in, it will take you to a page um, with the following questions. Um, what is unique about your subject discipline in terms of reading, writing, speaking and listening? What is common with other subject disciplines? How do members of the subject discipline use language? Are there any typical literacy misconceptions held by students? And then what words or phrases are typically or uniquely um, owned within your subject discipline? So click on that um, that link there and give yourself a few minutes to type some ideas, add in some, some thoughts against those post-it notes, and hopefully you'll be able to see others collaborating um, in that box as well. Okay, thank you for um, some of those ideas. I can see some of them are still coming in, um, but I think if we just, if we move on and we can come back to those later, um, if we have a few more people logged in. Um, so, Number two is to provide uh, targeted vocabulary instruction in every subject. Um, and this is really about teaching students the etymology and the morphology of the words. So etymology is the study of the structure of the word and morphology um, is the study of the structure of parts of the word. So it's kind of you can see on this doc document here that breaking down of photosynthesis, photo meaning light, sin meaning with or together, and thesis is setting or putting in place. So by teaching students um, to make those links, um, they might look at the word photo and break that down. Well, what's a photo? We have a flash with a camera, therefore we're talking about light and ideas. Um, sin meaning together, perhaps looking at other words like synchronized. Um, there's lots of different ways that we can break words down to kind of get students to unpick what some of those words um what some of those words mean so for example a mathematics teacher might explore the latin prefixes in shapes and key terms and then explicitly encourage pupils to spot the patterns between them so for example looking at words like quarter and quadrilateral so you're looking at the core 
um, word or the triangle and the triple looking at the uh, root word of tri. tri. Um, there are other patterns as well that you can have a look at. So octagon and octave within music. Um, so octagon in maths, meaning eight and maths octave again, eight. Um, so breaking down those those um, vocabulary words, looking at the origins and then looking at how they can cross over within subjects as well. It's a great way to teach new vocabulary. Um, and I know that many of us don't naturally know, know things like this. But in Google, if you literally just type in the word that you, you want to break down and type in followed by etymology, it will give you a picture like this and it will tell you um, what it is. So it's quite easy to copy and paste that and then pop that on your board to allow students to have a look or if you're if you've got Chromebooks in your school ask the students to just uh, google the etymology of the words um, and it will break it down in a very similar pattern so I did mention earlier that I was going to talk to you about um, Alex Quigley's book so 30 um, 30 million if you just have a look at that number there if you think about what that might represent so 30 million um, is the gap in the number of words children are exposed to is through sound by the age of four between advantaged and disadvantaged pupils. And that comes from more affluent families simply just having a higher level of vocabulary and talking to their children more often. And they're hearing 30 million more words than others. And that vocabulary gap, as evidenced in the um, earlier research that I showed you, just continues to grow and develop to, to almost two and a half years worth by the age of 15. So again, the third book that I would recommend is Closing the Vocabulary Gap um, by Alex Quigley. So um, as you can see here, there's a, kind of like a triangle that you can think about in terms of helping to build vocabulary with students. The first one is recognition. So looking at how the word is spelled um, and really like phonics would help to decode new vocabulary for students and be able to reproduce the spelling um, that makes a big difference for students. Looking at pronunciation and how the word is said is also really important. That will also link to the oracy aspect of um, improving literacy in secondary schools. Um, making people say the word aloud and use it in a sentence increases the likelihood that they'll remember it. And of course, helping to have that stick in their long term memory is going to be helpful for when they need to retrieve that later on when they're reading um, subject specific texts. And then finally, of course, definition is really important. So what does a word mean? But part of why disciplinary literacy is an important thing to focus on is that some words will have different meanings in different subject contexts as well. So you can think about using this triangle when you're also considering how you might build vocabulary for your students. OK, so just to talk about how we develop vocabulary um, at Chilton Academy. So we have a spelling form time. Um, it's something that you might be able to inc uh, implement into your pastoral curriculum. And um, this happens uh, once a week. And we also um, we give students words. We give them subject specific words and vocabulary that we collect from the departments. The uh, disciplinary literacy book that I mentioned earlier on has a huge um, appendix at the back of subject specific words that you could use. Um, as well. We also have a word of the week. Uh, we have keywords on the board explicitly that we explicitly teach. That's part of our teaching and learning policy is that keywords are always on the board. Um, and then that those words are copied and written accurately within students' work as well. We also promote literacy leaders in the classroom. And then we have we ensure that our keywords are in our knowledge organisers and toolkits. Now, I'd just like to stress to you this uh, message in this purple box here is the importance of teaching spelling and not simply testing it. Um, and I think this quote is quite poignant, um, definitely for me at school. Um, perhaps you remember being given 10 words to learn on Monday and then being tested on them on Fridays. You might also remember the teacher's frustration that people continue to misspell these words that they had only recently been tested on. And the issue there is, well, where was the teaching? How did we teach these spellings and, and where was the practicing element? So that, that's something to kind of think about and um, within your planning. So Hannah's just going to talk to you um, about a few of the different methods that you can use to help to teach spellings within um, your department areas or within your spelling form time, if that's something that your school would adopt. So one of um, the things that we use in form time spellings is the Freyer model. And to be fair, other subjects use this as well. So as you can see, you'll have um, a term that's going to be in the middle. It's a teacher selected word that is an important concept to be learned and can connect to other related terms as well. 
And then around that specific term, there are different ways to really help students completely understand this word. So you'll have the definition, which should include student friendly, a student friendly description of the term. You'll have characteristics, um, which are features that should help the students to recognize, identify, or distinguish the term. Examples, so these might be synonyms, concrete applications. It just, again, really depends on the way that you're going to use this word in the subject. And then finally, non-examples. So antonyms, um, opposite words, inappropriate applications, or relevant illustrations that don't fit the characteristics as well. So there is an example of this um, here. So you've got anarchy there where um, the Freire model is being used so that students can have an understanding of this word in a holistic manner. Um, again, Amy was talking about looking at um, morphology and um, looking at the root words. So one of the other things that we do in form time spellings is um, looking at suffixes and prefixes and sometimes looking at root words as well. So as, as you can see here, these are three different words um, that all use the same suffix. So um, this is, of course, a good example because it's going to help students to kind of use context clues and to use like um, their understanding of the word suffix if they were to see this in another unfamiliar word as well. And um, it also looks at the different root words so that they can figure out how they might use that in other applications as well. And this is the way that we also look at tier three words in form time spellings. So really form time spellings, um, which is something that I create for all form tutors, is also a way to kind of do some CPD for the rest of the teachers to support the way that they're going to address disciplinary literacy in the classroom. So um, apart from looking at tier two vocabulary and having a tier three focused vocabulary in each of the spelling sets, um, it's also an example for how teachers might teach vocabulary in their classroom. Because while it's important for uh, students to learn these words um, at all times and understand that it's important not only in geography, but in everyday life, um, they're also going to need to learn it in context. So here's an example, um, have the, the definition of the noun abrasion. There's also the adjective and verb form because they're going to need to use those word forms as well when they're writing responses. And then there's an application of how it's used in geography. And then finally, this is another thing that I have included in um, form time spellings, which is looking at the command word describe. So describe is a command word that is used in all three core subjects, but they look completely different from each other as well. So there are some things that are common between the three of them, but then there are also um, very specific differences. And I think that this is a very important thing for students to understand that when they're asked to describe something in science, they may be asked to recall some facts, events, or process in an accurate way. Whereas describing in English is completely different. They have to give an account of something and that's part of um, the exam as well that's worth a lot, worth a lot of mar marks. Whereas in maths, it's about using mathematical terminology to define the given information. And then finally, um, another thing that you can do to help create cross-curricular links is to look at different word origins. So for example, at Chiltern, we look at, we study French. So we are also looking at French word origins. You can definitely do this with Latin as well, with Italian. So there are just other ways that you can continue to create cross-curricular links while helping to build students' vocabulary. Um, another way that we can develop that uh, vocabulary with students is using uh, word gradients. So when we are looking at, um, so here we've got words for description um, and we're looking at movement or pace. So the slow to fast, you can see how um, the vocabulary choices move from crawl, limp, prance, right up to things like dart, run and sprint. And that helps to avoid students using the basic vocabulary of walk or words like said, which we find come up far too often. Um, we often would call those taboo words, words like bad, nice, good, that, that don't necessarily have any meaning. And creating these word gradient lists expands the student's vocabulary. They can come up with these together. Um, it brings in some mathematical um, elements as well as they're looking at kind of ranking, sorting and organising um, in order to kind of develop and enhance their knowledge of the synonyms that they could use in the future. 
Um, so it is essential that we think about which words we choose to teach when we think about how do we teach vocabulary um, and most importantly that tier three vocabulary. So I've got here for you um, an example of a year six SATS paper um, and you can see here that there are a significant amount of tier two and tier three words. So in the chat box if you just take a moment which tier two and tier three vocabulary can you see in this extract here? Okay, thank you for your um, contributions. These are some of the words that you should see. So conquered, superior, discoveries, inventions. Um, there's lots and lots of words there. And then there's really specific subject words here. Um, so words like kilograms, biologist, um, published, uh, domestication. These are words that students may not naturally know unless they are explicitly taught to them um, by their teachers. So when you are giving out a text in your classroom, it's worth just spending some time on your own just highlighting, first of all, what are the tier two words? What are the tier three words? And how are we going to teach them to the students? Um, so you can come back to this another time, but here's a, a little checklist that you can use to support the teaching of this. So once you've got your, your text, we found our words, um, we, you then need to start thinking about the comprehension. So which words are only gonna need brief attention? Which words will you elaborate and give more attention to? And then how are you gonna make sure the students can use these in their own writing? We need to think here more about the ability in terms of reading as well. Um, it's one thing to be able to read the word, but it's then about reading to learn. So do we learn from what we have read? Do we understand it within context? And making sure that the students can make that um, jump between being able to say the word, um, potentially spell the word, but then comprehend it and understand it um, in the sense that it's been written in. So. Just to summarise on how to teach vocabulary, make sure that you pre-teach that vocabulary before the writing task. Um, students will not use the words in their writing unless they know what the words mean. Um, if you don't teach them, they will just write the, the normal words that they've got in their standard English vocabulary and the writing will seem a bit limited. But by pre-teaching them and giving them high expectations to use tier two or tier three vocabulary, uh, you will get a much higher quality piece of writing. Explore the common root words as well. Um, focus on the prefixes, as Hannah's mentioned, segment the words, make sure you've got dictionaries available in your classroom, um, signpost students to synonyms, even when they're talking, ask them to up-level their vocabulary, um, teach them the spelling instructions, give low-stakes quiz into re for retrieval practice, think about your words of the week and making sure that in every lesson you have your keywords on the board and that should hopefully help to improve uh, the vocabulary within your classroom. So the next step on the EEF um, guidance for improving literacy is to break down the complex writing task. Now, writing is demanding because it requires students to combine three processes. There's the composition, which is essentially um, the words, ideas and sentences that are used within the writing. There's the, um, the function or the executive function, which is the, the reason for writing, uh, the planning that goes involved and the kind of editing process. And then there's the transcription, which is essentially the, the physical act of writing itself. Um, and you can see that we've got that cycle in terms of planning, editing, revising, evaluating, drafting and goal setting. And it kind of becomes slightly interchangeable as long as you're continually focusing on the purpose and audience. But by having those three um, sections together, the brain is going into overdrive because we're not just thinking about, I've got these ideas, and then I need to think about my structure, then I need to think about actually writing it. And the brain can kind of um, be a little bit overwhelmed. And that's why students sometimes think that, that writing is too much. Um, so it's about teaching students to cope with the challenge um, of writing um, and breaking down these complex writing tasks. So um, the handwriting assessment for teachers gives these um, words per minute suggestions um, that I've got over here on the right. So a 12 year old, for example, should be able to write 16 words per minute. This is obviously on average. It does obviously depend on the child. Um, and that's going to account for things like thinking time as well. So they've got thought about what they're writing. One um, element that we do promote within our lessons is, is students should write at least one line per minute, um, not necessarily focusing on words, but that gives students um, that gives students an opportunity to kind of think, well, I've got five minutes, let me try and write five lines. Um, or I've got 30 minutes, let me try and write a page, which is roughly um, what they would be able to achieve. 
and it gives them that kind of breaks down the barrier of how much do I need to write. Um, another way of doing this when a student's reluctant is just to put a dot on the page and say, I'd like you to get here. So write to the dot within the next five minutes and that can motivate them. And then you can move the dot slowly along the page to guide them. Um, but other tips that you can use to break down complex writing tasks is things like scaffold in writing um, give them sentence starters, give them uh, close activities um, where they can sort out which words they think they're going to use. Um, teach them the meaning of the command words, as Hannah mentioned, teach them how to plan um, and then think about metacognition. So often we ask students to write something, but how often do we stop and say, right, put your pens down, read over your work, read it out loud. Where are your mistakes? What bit could you improve? What bit could you change? Um, it's sometimes teachers don't do that until the very end of the lesson or the very end of the piece of writing. And actually it's it's more helpful for the students for that metacognition to stop and break that down um, every few paragraphs or so, so that they can see the improvement and they can see the changes in their work. Um, if they've missed something crucial out early on, that's gonna have an impact on the ending of their work. So it's better that they identify those errors early. So making a conscious effort within your planning, particularly if you're doing a writing task, for them to proofread and edit their own work. And again, a huge focus on spelling, punctuation and grammar and paragraphing. And then another idea, break down the question, model the writing to the students the first time that it is expected, and then try to gradually take that scaffold um, away for the students. So an example here um, about how to, of how to break down the question. So you can see this question, I've highlighted um, keywords, the keyword evaluate, which is the command word, and we've broken down here what that means. So pros and cons, for and against, weigh up, assess, consider. So the students have got a very firm understanding of what evaluate actually means. So the question here, evaluate whether Sunita and Pradesh should book a package holiday or an independent holiday. So the key word there again is or, um, meaning you need to talk about both. So they need to they need to evaluate both sides of this argument here, looking at the pros and the cons. You can also see the bit in blue, um, which are the key points to consider, the information that the question has given them. So using colours, using labels to kind of break down questions um, will help them to understand exactly what they need to do. Um, so think about these collaboration to develop your writing skills. Try and develop links with feeder schools as well. What did the students' writing look like in year six? What you'll see at primary school is that the, the writing is much more cross-curricular in terms of extended writing than in secondary school. You'll often find them um, writing stories about Africa, um, cross-curricular with geography, or writing um, diary entries from famous people within history. Um, so there's lots and lots of links there. But it's important to think about what that looked like in primary school. Um, one thing that we do here as part of our transition is to take the students' best piece of writing in year six um, from the, the big feeder schools and we stick it in the front of their um, exercise books or in their transition folders in year seven. And, and that's for all subjects to look back on and see what the writing was like at the end of year six so that we can sustain those standards and the students know what they're capable of as well. Uh, when they come up here and they know that they can't regress and um, because we know how well they did before and um, make sure that your departments as well are collaborating with your English department what do the requirements of different formats look like and how are these taught so in your department if you wanted to write a diary entry how does a diary entry get taught in English and what does that look like if you're writing a letter what does that look like in English how can we um, enhance the teaching of those skills um, across the curriculum so something we've done here, each member of the English department is assigned as a literacy link to a department within the school. And they've got a go to person to support with these things and to help them break down questions and to give them the writing formats um, and link things within lessons as well. So that's something that you could try. There's another example here of um, literacy links. This was for a travel and tourism lesson. Um, and we can see here. Um, a modelled essay with colour codes broken down for students. There's connectives highlighted and put in bold for students as well. Um, and then you can see the structure of the essay there with the introduction, development and the conclusion. I won't, I won't keep this up for too long, but feel free to have a flick back through or pause the video and you can look at how that's structured clearly. But an English department being able to sit and work with another department to create resources like this will be invaluable, resources that you can use over and over again. Um, again, here's another example from a history lesson. Um, and you can see here a breakdown created by Literacy Link in terms of how to analyse, how to develop objective writing, how to explain, um, what to do with how much type questions, 
um, and lots of different ideas there that are kind of leading on. So all of these resources that you can make across your school um, will, will be very beneficial in terms of a literacy link role. So the fifth um, element of the EEF is combining writing instruction with reading in every subject. Now I don't want to talk too much about reading as I'm aware this is a writing section, but reading and writing do go hand in hand. Students that are better readers will naturally be better writers. They will have a better vocabulary. They will have a better understanding of um, sentence structure and vocabulary. And this will then transfer into their own creative writing as well. So reading has been shown to improve the quality of students writing. Um, while writing about texts improves students reading comprehension and fluency. So there is a real um, marriage between the two concepts here. Um, again, as I've just mentioned, reading high quality texts in every subject um, is so important. It's not just about them reading a novel in their English lessons. It's about being able to read um, original sources in history or reading newspapers about certain topics or reading realistic science reports or, or geography reports, for example, or in French, reading authentic texts or whatever language it is that you teach in your school. Um, so those high quality texts in every subject um, effectively illustrate the conventions of the different types of writing. So you, you're essentially showing the students what it is that they need to be able to achieve to sound like a writer in geography or a writer in science or a writer in PE, linking back to the book um, by Jennifer Webb that I mentioned at the start. Um, and writing before reading as well. So, for example, by asking students to bullet point what they already know about a topic or generate questions that they can later try and answer through their reading. Asking students to write short summaries of the text that they've read. Um, although students do struggle with this initially, um, writing a one sentence summary of a paragraph or just a quick bullet point about what's happening in this paragraph can really help students to think more carefully about well, actually, what is the what is this text trying to say? What am I trying to comprehend here? And then um, finally, creating checklists um, based on good writing in each subject. So, for example, phrases, um, get the students to highlight or, or understand phrases like, well, due to this, a contributory factor was um, giving them those sentence starters or checklists that students can then transfer into their own writing. And um, so one element that we have here at Chilton Academy is our subject specific drop everything and read. So we initially launched the dear time um, a couple of years ago and it was just reading for pleasure. And then over time we've adapted this to include subject specific dear time and within our curriculum um, we this is an original example from last year. We would have a drop down time um, scheduled into the calendar twice a week, once for reading for pleasure and once for subject um, reading, where whichever class they were in at that time would make, would be reading subject specific texts, um, texts that are authentic to that subject area. What we've now done, because this has become much more embedded, is we've been able to take away some of that structure and give staff autonomy as to when this best fits within their curriculum. Um, and that we quality assure these texts as well. So we have a, a Google Drive folder where staff put in their text that they're reading for that half term. Um, and we, as the English department, uh, with the literacy links and with Hannah's disciplinary lead, literacy lead, will quality assure those texts and just make sure that they're accessible for children and that they're supported by um, comprehension tasks that are appropriate. So we do use our literacy links to help craft those um, subject specific texts as well so that um, students can access it. It's very important that when you are looking for subject text that the word level um, can be accessed by students, particularly if there are inability groups. You wouldn't necessarily give your set one the same text as you would give your bottom set. Um, but it's about making sure that the texts are appropriate. And this really helps to teach subject specific vocabulary. Um, equally, it's practicing comprehension and then your modeling formats that you would need for your subject specific writing later. This is one of the things that I think has had the biggest impact in terms of improving reading and writing um, here and definitely something that I would recommend. Um, our next section um, is providing opportunities for structured talk. Um, disciplinary literacy um, feeds really nicely into this, this idea of oracy and creating um, confident and competent speakers within all areas of the curriculum. So talk um, is, a, is a huge powerful tool for learning and literacy. Not only does it improve reading and writing outcomes, but it increases their understanding their communication skills um, and their discussion. So the EEF talk about accountable talk, which is um, firstly having knowledge. So for example, to, to find out, to seek what is accurate and true, using talk to reason, so to provide justifications and claims for things, and then also as a community development 
So showing skills of listening and showing respect for others. So there's a lot of power that you can get out of talk that you can then um, transfer into your writing. So just here are a few bullet points really of, of things that you can do within your own lessons. So in terms of structured talk, teachers modeling what effective talk sounds like in their subject. So making sure that teachers speak in professional language at all times and they speak in standard English as well at all times. And that not only do we model it, but that we pick up on it when students are not using the correct language and we'll stop and we'll say, actually, no, can you rephrase that sentence? Could you potentially up level that word? Can you use subject language instead of um, the slang word that you potentially just used and getting them to really up level what they've said out loud? And that will then help when they come to write in their work as well. Um, deliberately sequence the talk activities alongside the reading and writing tasks. So they're able to talk about what they've read. They're able to talk about what they've written and then they're practicing their vocabulary as well. Um, sentence starters as well. We often use them for writing, but how often do we use them for talking? So giving students kind of ways to start arguments if you're having a debate um, or ways to start uh, speeches if you're delivering a presentation, but giving them those oral cues to kind of guide their talk, which will then transfer as well into their writing. Also think about the questions that you use when in your teaching. How many questions are closed and require students to give you one or two words in comparison to how many are open? Um, ended questions and how long do you give students to talk freely and to really discuss those answers as well. Um, set the goals and the roles for small group discussions. Make sure that there's a clear outcome for conversations and that everybody in the group has a role to play, whether that is um, a note taker, a listener, um, a summariser. Just make sure that everybody has, has something to do so that that talk is collab collaboratively practised. Um, give students wait time as well. When you're asking them for a question, ask them to pause um, once they've given you their answer. Give them a chance to think about, OK, how would you say that better? How could you say that differently? And then ask them to go again. And um, so hopefully the level of talk um, improves as well. And then make sure you're giving precise feedback to those students as well, relating to those um, different types of talk accountability. So just some examples of oracy that we've got at Chilton Academy. We have our oracy guidelines. These are on the walls in posters, they're in our pupil planners and toolkits, uh, they're in our staff handbooks as well. Um, and they are the rules that we insist on for talk in all areas of the curriculum. Um, and part of this is just about having good manners. So things like saying please and thank you, uh, good morning and good afternoon, but equally making sure that students speak in full sentences at all times, that they wait their turn to speak and they don't interrupt because with talk comes that power of listening teaching them what the visual cues are for talk, so nodding or hand gestures um, so that they present themselves as confident speakers, making sure the, the words and phrases are appropriate, as we mentioned in terms of vocabulary, thinking about the audience, are they speaking in the correct tone? Are they being formal enough? Are they addressing their audience appropriately and adapting their talk? And what about their volume? It's very, um, it's very easy in a class for you to hear a student speak and then for the teacher to, to hear them and move on, but have the rest of the class actually heard. And asking students to speak up, increase the volume. Sometimes we say things like, just say it 10% louder, 10% louder. And then that gives students the confidence to, um, to try and raise their voice so that we can hear them. And um, particularly if they're sat in a strange place within the room, it allows them to express their volume, but it is important to make sure everybody can be heard. Make sure students know when to pause for impact um, and or to pause to allow someone else to respond. Um, we do not allow non-standard English or slang at all. And we ask students to avoid beginning sentences with things like, well, basically miss or stuff like that. Um, they say stuff a lot. There's lots of other words that they say that we want them to not use so often. So we'll, we'll stop them and say, please don't say that. Can you say it like this? Um, and get them to rephrase. And then we also have our habits of discussion cards, which you can see over on the right. So we have got a strong focus this year on debating. Um, and we, we've given students these cards um, to use to kind of not just begin sentences in their written work, but to develop their sentences in their oral debates as well. Um, I know our French teacher is, has translated these into French as well for her lessons. Um, so that again, it's a cross curricular tool that we can use um, for debating um, in different subjects as well as within writing. Um, so just as we come towards the end of our session, um, 
I just I would have said to go back into a breakout room and have a, a look at these, but potentially you can have a look at these questions in your um, subject areas or whoever you're watching this with collaboratively back in your schools. But if you just spend a bit of time reflecting on how you can promote disciplinary literacy within your classroom, within your subject, and then if you're a leader across the school, what strategies can you implement to develop the use of vocabulary within your students' writing? What can you make to improve, uh, sorry, what links can you make to improve the quality of writing within your subject area and to enhance the structure of the writing frames that you provide students with as well? And then where can structured talk and subject specific reading be incorporated within your curriculum um, to enhance the quality of writing across the school as well? So um, if there's any questions, I'm happy to um, answer them for you if you could drop me an email. Um, and then equally, there's some links on the end of this PowerPoint for any further reading. Um, so as I've mentioned, any questions, please do free to drop us an email. Um, I'd like to thank Hannah for coming on um, as a guest speaker today. And I hope you found um, that session useful. And thank you for your time um, in listening to our video. Thanks, everybody. Bye bye.